Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started uh, just to be respectful of everyone's time and to keep us um, on track with our timeline. First off, thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Carrie Stallwitz, and I am on the board of the Architecture Center Houston, Houston Foundation. And in that capacity, I have the uh, great privilege to work with the committee putting together programs like we are bringing to you tonight, uh, bringing new light, 50 years of the Rothko Chapel. Um, I wanna first off say uh, and recognize Jennifer Ward, who is our associate director. Jennifer, thank you so much. She's the person who uh, made sure all of our technology was working tonight and enabled uh, the recording of this that will be available on YouTube later. So Jennifer, thank you. Uh, and then before we get into the program, I do have a couple of housekeeping announcements to make. Uh, first off is that uh, we do have time allotted at the end of the remarks for question and answer. So as we're going along, however, you can type your questions in the Q&A uh, feature in Zoom, and then we will get to those as we can at the end. So please utilize that feature. And then secondly, like I just mentioned, uh, this program is going to be recorded and available on the, um, the AIA YouTube channel following the event. So with that, let's get to the reason we're all here tonight, which is to hear about the uh, renovation of the beloved Houston landmark, the Rothko Chapel, which was closed for over a year of renovations and then reopened uh, on the occasion of its 50th anniversary. Um, it was a uh, commissioned by Dominique and um, John DeManil and opened in 1971 under perhaps we could say less than optimal lighting for the beautiful uh, site-specific uh, Mark Rothko paintings that are featured inside the chapel. So we have the great honor to have with us tonight um, uh, for people who worked very closely on the project, we have Neil Patel and Alyssa Chastain from the Architecture of Research Office and George Sexton and Owen Brady from George Sexton Associates who are gonna tell us all about how we are bringing new light into to the Rothko Chapel. But to introduce them, I'm gonna turn it over to a fellow board member um, from the Architecture Center Houston board, Gregory Benjamin, who's gonna be moderating our discussion tonight. Uh, Greg is a licensed architect here in Houston, where he um, got a Bachelor of Architecture degree from UT Austin. He's a very active member of our local AIA chapter, serving on the Michael G. Myers Scholarship Committee, the Emerging Professionals Committee, and he's also very active in our recently formed uh, Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion co uh, Collective. Um, I work with him very closely on the Programming and Exhibitions Committee. Um, Greg is also a native Houstonian and he works very hard to balance um, the role of practicing architect with citizen architect by being active in his community, which is the historic third ward here in Houston. So in that capacity, he's been very active in, in boards and the um, civic and super neighborhoods as well. So with that introduction, I would like to turn it over to Greg to go ahead and kick us off. Thanks, Gary. Um, and as you may, as you can see, I am actually happy to broadcast from the Architecture Center uh, Houston, uh, located in downtown Houston on the north side of downtown Houston at 902 Commerce. Um, as you may know, um, the Architecture Center was damaged heavily during, uh, during Hurricane Harvey. And not only are we celebrating opening uh, post-pandemic, but we are also celebrating opening to the public after um, a two-year rebuilding effort um, from the storm. So we welcome you to come visit us. Um, our, our public uh, hours are 9 to 5, Monday to Thursday and nine to three on Friday. Um, the current exhibit is the Visions 2020 exhibit. Um, it will be up until uh, August, the end of August this year. And so again, we encourage you to come visit us. Now to introduce further our panelists um, who will be giving the presentation. Um, 
Neil Patel is a project director at the Architecture Research Office. He holds an undergrad degree from the University of Texas at Austin. Neil joined the firm in 2008 and has since become project director, supervising project design and, and management, office operations and culture. He has worked on numerous ARO projects, including the R House, Five Principles for Greenwich South, and managed academic projects such as the Nuppert Stadium West Pavilion at the University of Cincinnati and directed academic projects at Tulane University's Robert Greenbaum House and Brown University's Applied Math Building. He most recently oversaw phase one of the renovation and campus expansion for the Rothko and is working on the phase two campus expansion as well as the new Brooklyn School. Alyssa Chastain is a project manager at the Architecture Research Office where she holds an undergrad degree in architecture from Wellesley College and a master's of architecture from Yale University. Alyssa joined the firm in 2017 and has since worked on the Frederick Church Center concept design and has managed the phase one of the renovation uh, and campus expansion of the Rothko Chapel. Uh, Alyssa is working on the phase two campus expansion and a mass timber learning lab at the University of Washington in Tacoma. Before ARO, she worked with Benish Architecton and Beige State Burge and Cox. And after ARO's presentation, we'll have a presentation by George Sexton and Associate. George Sexton in 1980 established George Sexton and Associates, an office dedicated to providing consulting services in the areas of lighting design and museum design and planning services. Mr. Sexton earned a degree in architecture from Virginia Polytech Institute and State University. Prior to forming his own firm, he worked as a lighting designer for Claude Engel and is a museum specialist for the National Gallery of Art. As acting director for the Sainsbury Center for Visual Arts in England and as chief exhibition designer and head of design with the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. In 47 years of practice, he has built an extensive history of involvement with challenging projects of all scales. He has established a highly professional and innovative approach to the field of museum and lighting design. Mr. Sexton lectures wildly on lighting and exhibition design. He is a member of the Illuminating Engineering Society, the International Association of Lighting Designers, and the American Institute of Architects. Owen Brady is a partner at George Sexton and Associates and has served as project manager for many projects, including several in the areas of lighting design for museums, libraries, and cultural institutions. Mr. Brady's work at George Sexton Associates has included extensive design and analysis of both daylighting and artificial lighting for the display of light sensitive artwork and artifacts. Mr. Brady has degrees in engineering and architectural studies from Brown University. Prior to working at GSA, he refined his design skills at the Baltimore City Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation and Dean's Lewis McKinley Architecture. So we are grateful for our panelists this evening and look forward to a wonderful presentation and question and answer. Thanks a lot, Greg. Um, I think Alyssa is gonna start sharing her screen. And I wanna thank um, Architecture Center Houston and IA Houston uh, for inviting us to be part of this um, discussion today. Uh, as Greg mentioned, I'm a project director at ARO um, involved uh, from the beginning of the project uh, uh, at Rothko. Uh, and Alyssa was the project manager who's been um, managing the project uh, since uh, schematic design. So um, we've been both been working on the project with our uh, two principals at ARO, Adam Mirinsky and Stephen Cassell. So I wanna mention them uh, here at the top. Uh, I'm gonna give a quick overview uh, of uh, the project and then Alyssa's gonna go into a little bit more detail on some of the technical aspects of the um, actual chapel renovation. Um, so next slide.
So the project really um, begins, as Carrie mentioned, uh, with the collaboration between uh, the Demonels and Mark Rothko. Um, these are a couple of photographs of his studio here in Manhattan. Um, and the Manils commissioned Rothko to achieve what he had long sought to do, which was to create a place that would touch the deepest emotions. And uh, the Rothko Chapel, um, it's a place where I, I um, had a history growing up in north of Houston. So I was familiar with um, this, this place and the space and how important it is um, within the city of Houston. And it's really a place where the art and architecture are just intrinsically linked in the service of creating um, a truly unique and powerful experience. And um, experience is gonna be really a recurring theme um, as we start to talk about uh, the elements of the project and um, what drove uh, decisions throughout the design process and, and execution of the project. Um, so next slide. Um, in addition to uh, the Rockley Chapel being a place, it's also a program. And um, their program is really a mission that's centered around uh, human rights, both in the local community and, and globally. Um, and uh, the, these kind of two elements, uh, the social connection uh, embodied in the programming uh, within the uh, chapel and the grounds uh, and the um, very personal experience within uh, the chapel are kind of uh, two driving forces and factors that we that were kind of ever present in, in the development of the design. Uh, on the next slide. The essence of our work uh, was really to strengthen and reinforce the relationship between um, these two kind of elements. It, and this was a diagram that we really kind of developed or kind of came together very early in the process, an idea of the chapel um, being a place, a sanctuary, we always call it the sanctuary, but a place for contemplation uh, and reflection. And then the campus itself uh, and the program uh, being a catalyst for action. And, and that sort of um, binary relationship being, you know, uh, ultimately represented by the chapel and its relationship to the uh, Barnett Newman's Brooklyn Obelisk sculpture. Um, on the next slide, uh, through collaboration with um, the Rothko Chapel Board, which consisted of um, uh, Christopher Rothko, Mark Rothko's son, uh, the executive director, David Leslie, uh, and a number of historians uh, and ar architects uh, within the community. Um, they, we really developed a set of project principles um, that again, the first two really focus on uh, the experience both inside the chapel and outside the chapel. Um, and these uh, principles drove uh, the overall and the initial phase of the project, which was a master plan. Uh, so on the next slide, I'll just give a brief overview. Uh, what was completed um, recently is considered, uh, we call phase one of the project, and it includes the renovation of the, um, of the chapel itself uh, and landscape improvements uh, on the south um, side of Sol Ross. So Sol Ross is uh, the east-west street on the north side of the chapel. Um, phase one also included uh, the creation of a new welcome house across the across Sol Ross on the um, just to the northwest of the chapel, uh, as well as an energy house um, that currently houses a, uh, a backup generator and um, electrical facilities that are raised up off the ground um, uh, for resilience, essentially. Um, on the next slide, phase two, which I'll just briefly give an overview of, uh, but we won't get into detail today, uh, really ultimately reframes the chapel within uh, a new landscape that includes uh, a meditation garden to the west of the chapel and a birch grove uh, to the east. And uh, it relocates the uh, admin buildings, uh, admin bungalows that are currently west of the chapel um, and relocates the admin offices to a new building um, across the street, uh, as well as a new program center uh, that would support all of the um, chapel programming. So. Part of this was also a, a desire and need to um, uh, focus uh, and clarify uh, the purpose and use of the chapel and kind of um, uh, recenter it um, uh, as part of kind of a, a personal singular experience and um, also allow a, an opportunity for uh, the public outreach that um, is an intrinsic part of uh, the chapel's mission uh, to occur uh, right on campus. So we call um, the elements on the north side of Sol Ross, the north campus, and the elements on the south, uh, the south campus. On the next slide, we also want to acknowledge um, that the visitor experience of the chapel starts outside of the building itself, uh, and the landscape that was designed by Nelson Bergwaltz uh, really supports the visitor experience uh, both before and after um, 
entering the chapel, entering and exiting the chapel. Um, the landscape design includes uh, elements that are in support of uh, some of the strategies uh, that George Sexton will talk about uh, later in terms of training your eye uh, for the, an optimal experience within the chapel. And that starts from the outside where we selected uh, a slightly darker um, paving color for the uh, primary plaza, but maintained uh, the look and feel of the exposed aggregate um, uh, panels there. Uh, and the addition of uh, a, the birch grove and additional shade, shade trees uh, also helped to bring the overall uh, light level down, down and start uh, the process of, um, uh, of preparing uh, your eye and, and yourself uh, to experience the, the, um, the sanctuary space. On the next slide, over the years, um, there have been a number of uh, renovations that Carrie alluded to, um, typically in response to uh, addressing kind of the harsh lighting conditions in, in Houston, which were uh, much different from uh, Manhattan where those paintings were, um, uh, where the panels were uh, created. Uh, George uh, and Owen from George Sexton Associates will speak uh, in much more detail about the, the lighting strategy. Um, but the last major renovation of, of the building was done in 1999. Um, and if you look at the next slide, uh, the approach that um, the firm took was not of a pure uh, restoration to a point in time. Uh, it was uh, all about honoring the original intent and uh, the experience that was never ultimately realized. So, um, you know, we touched almost every surface uh, outside and inside the building but our presence is largely effaced. And what, what really was important to us was uh, the quality of the experience, the quality um, both uh, visually, acoustically, um, uh, as, you, as you enter the space. Uh, the scope of work uh, of, the, of the restoration include, uh, re included reinforcing the structure of the chapel, uh, strengthening the existing masonry walls, repairing uh, the original brick ex uh, exterior, um, replacing the roof, replacing the skylight, adding flood protection uh, at the doors for resiliency and relocating uh, the HVAC, HVAC equipment, um, as I mentioned before, across uh, across uh, Sol Ross. Um, and that in addition, uh, there are a number of kind of minor uh, modifications and finish it, uh, adjustments uh, to refine that experience that um, Alyssa is gonna speak to. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, so one focus of the project was uh, clarifying and simplifying the entry sequence um, into the chapel. And in the 1999 renovation, um, as part of mechanical up upgrades, um, these glass walls were added to the foyer space to create a vestibule. Um, and within this room that was created, uh, the chapel added a welcome desk, which included chapel liter uh, literature and uh, gift shop elements. So in this plan, which shows the previous condition from 1999, the entry sequence is rather disjointed in experience. Um, and as we began to make adjustments, we were careful to study any elements uh, that would impact the facade. Uh, in this case, um, it's really the distance the entry doors are set back from that brick opening. So in our proposed plan, um, the vestibule is compressed uh, to create a more generous foyer space that flows directly into uh, the chapel sanctuary without needing to go through another set of doors on the interior. Um, and all of the gift shop functions and elements are relocated to the new visitor center across the street. Uh, so the purpose of the, of the foyer um, is to prepare to enter into the main sanctuary space. It's a chance to let your eyes adjust from the exterior lighting to the much dimmer lighting um, on the interior of the chapel. And one thing we worked with uh, George Sexton and, uh, and associates to do is to select slightly darker colors, um, darker versions of the sanctuary wall colors for the foyer, just to bring those light levels down. Uh, another goal of the project was to improve the acoustics of the space uh, to support the range of programs that the chapel hosts. Um, and we worked with threshold acoustics uh, to calibrate um, a layout of absorptive and reflective uh, plaster surfaces in the chapel foyer and in the um, chapel sanctuary ceiling uh, to am support amplified and non-amplified programs. Um, and 
replacing the ceiling also allowed us to remove the, the popcorn ceiling finish uh, in, the, in the chapel sanctuary with a smoother, um, finer grained uh, acoustic plaster. Uh, and as construction began um, and some of the plaster was beginning to be demoed, we noticed uh, substantial cracks in the CMU. Um, and further investigation uh, showed that the building was actually unreinforced. Um, and that would have been fine with 1974 code, which is when the building was originally constructed, uh, but wouldn't meet current uh, construction code. And there was also some concerns about um, uh, essentially wind loads uh, on the re unreinforced CMU. So the solution was to cut vertical slots into the CMU, uh, install rebar, and then fully grout the cavity. And this was done 24 to 30 inches on center around the entire per perimeter of the building. Uh, and one opportunity that the reinforcement work afforded us was to just very slightly adjust the uh, geometry of that northernmost apse wall. Um, and we moved that wall in six inches, which is imperceptible, I think, when you're standing inside uh, looking at the painting. But what it does do is add just a little bit more um, space between the top of the panel and the shadow line created by the skylight. Uh, and in addition to renderings and models to communicate design um, to the client, and to actually to communicate within the team, we used several uh, full-scale in-place mock-ups um, to study different uh, different options. Um, we used them to look at uh, the skylight louvers, day lighting, and then also the projector lighting for the panels themselves. We also confirmed um, colors in person uh, via sort of in-place mock-up. And I'll let uh, George Sexton and Associates speak more to the actual skylight design. But um, one thing that I think is worth hi highlighting is uh, that most of the equipment for the, the sanctuary space is actually concealed within the ring that surrounds the skylight. So there are um, projectors that light uh, the sky, uh, that light the panels that happen um, at each of the facets. And those projectors then go in acoustic enclosures, which mitigate the fan noise. Uh, and each of those enclosures are then also mechanically cooled. So there was a good deal of coordination that had to happen to make all of that work. And in addition to um, sort of the projector lighting, there's uh, general lighting, emergency lighting, uh, there's speakers up in that space, uh, microphone trapeze, and security equipment. So the idea really was to just try to conceal as much as possible so it didn't affect your uh, experience of the space. And ultimately, I think the measure of success for this project is the extent to which our efforts uh, disappear in the completed space and the focus is returned to the, the Rothko panels. And I think I can turn this over to George and Owen. Thank you, Allison. Uh, I want to thank um, uh, Jennifer and Carrie and, and Greg uh, th this evening. And Owen and I are looking forward to presenting uh, some of the things that we worked on uh, in the chapel. Uh, Owen? So let's go to the next slide. We, uh, when we, when I was asked by uh, Christopher Rothko to interview and submit a proposal for the chapel, um, I think uh, we did a little bit of research and, and you know, I've been, <clears throat> I had seen the chapel in the 80s, 1980s, after it had opened, I had always uh, heard and understood some of the problems um, with uh, the lighting of the chapel, particularly the daylighting. And uh, what, you know, in studying the, uh, the history of the chapel, this is, these are images from Rothko's studio in New York where he painted the paintings and did full scale, uh, really tried to mock up the walls full scale to understand the proportions of the space. And we really became very aware of the sort of the slide on the left and the parachute, which was underneath the clear, clear story lighting um, in, in his studio. And this was really, he liked to work in subdued lighting levels. Uh, and I think this was certainly a very important, uh, became a very important element as we developed the lighting for the chapel. Uh, next slide. Uh, as Alyssa and, and Neil mentioned, um, 
when the chapel opened in, in 71, the really it was evident that the bright daylight in Houston was something that really hadn't been considered. And here you can see how the, the lighting, most of the lighting is in the center of the room. Uh, it's pretty overwhelming and it puts the painting, it put the paintings in shadow. Um, the image on the right is sort of a dusk image of the same configuration where the artificial lighting really took over. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that it really created a lot of different harsh effects. And I think uh, the paintings are so subtle that the, the lighting was something that you noticed and it really didn't uh, support uh, some of the, I think, subtle effects that Rothko was seeking in, in, in his work. Next. Um, another iteration uh, on the left where they blocked out uh, the skylight, I think was unfortunate. It really did change the whole experience of proportion of the space and, and the way one visitor or the way visitors would experience the paintings. And then the image on the right is uh, was the 1999 renovation, which was basically introducing a parachute uh, or actually a parachute type effect, uh, umbrella type effect, uh, which really shot light across the ceiling. It emphasized the texture in the ceiling. And although it delivered light uh, to the the paintings, it was it was it really made a bigger feature of the ceiling than I think was intended. Uh, next. Uh, one of our early sketches uh, and one of the things that we really understood um, right from the beginning is that the perception and experience of the chapel starts in the outside, from the outside as you approach the chapel. And if you look at the landscape today versus this image on the, the left today, there was not a lot of protection from the the Texas uh, natural light. Um, the finishes are brighter. It's a very, you know, when you're outside, the experience is quite high. Um, and if you look at the diagram on the upper right, you know, you have levels of 10,000 uh, foot candles and you're really, the chapel needed to be for conservation reasons and also for aesthetic reasons, it needed to be in the 25. So really walking from 10,000 to 25 needed to be, you needed to have some transitions and those transitions really needed to start with the finishes on the outside and the the shade uh, that the new landscape provides. And uh, so that, and that helps your eye begin to adapt. And as you enter the, the vestibule foyer with the darker finishes, uh, your eye begins to, you know, be really prepared so that when you walk into the chapel, rather than it being a, a dark experience, it's more of an uplift, uplifting experience. So there are different ways of stepping down and then stepping back up when you enter the chapel. Uh, the louver system and the daylight uh, contr control concept is really about directing light to the walls, to the paintings, and uh, and mitigating it in the space. Next, um, we I've been working with daylight for many many years. Um, the Brandywine River Museum is a reference experience that I think uh, pertains to what we were doing. Uh, it's a louver system that directs light and controls daylight on the walls in this gallery, which is exhibiting very sensitive watercolors by Jamie Wyeth. Um, a similar louver system for the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art, which directs light to the ceiling uh, and keeps light off the wall where they at times display sensitive textiles and tapestries. Um, the, the Rubens Gallery at the Ringland Museum of Art, a similar louver system, which bounces light off the ceiling and back down into the space to protect these works on paper, which are huge cartoons by Ruben. And then the Star Spangled Banner uh, is a, a project that we worked on with the Smithsonian in Washington. Uh, it's a very sensitive, uh, the Star Spangled Banner is a very sensitive textile. So it, there's no daylight there because the levels of light are so low, it would not permit daylight. But we used a digital projector system to carefully um, modulate and control light uh, evenly on the Star Spangled Banner. Next. Um, anyway, Owen, do you want to? 
Sure, thank you. We thought we'd share a few images of the modeling process that we used in developing the louver system for the skylight. And in particular, doing large scale physical modeling was a really critical and key uh, aspect of developing the system. So here on the upper left, you can see this is a one to 12 scale model that uh, we have had built and is, uh, was on the roof of our building which we use to test the, uh, the louver design. And this is basically built at this scale such that you can actually get into the model from underneath and be in the space at a scale eye level and get a sense of what the daylight is really going to look like and feel like as, as you experience the space as a visitor. And so you can see, um, up on top of the model, these are this is a scale version of the louver system that we designed, which was uh, 3D printed. We use this model as a tool for taking measurements of daylight levels. So here you can see we actually have a, a light meter within the model so that we could understand how much light the paintings are going to be receiving over the course of a year. Um, and keeping that to an acceptable uh, illumination level based on conservation standards. And this uh, model also is very useful for doing things like testing the finishes, um, things like the finishes of the louver blades themselves, the uh, vertical face of the skylight opening, looking at you know, modulating the, um, the brightness of the ceiling itself. And also this model was really it really provided a forum where members of the team from ARO, from the chapel staff and board could come and see the proposed design and look at the options and have a sense of you know, what it's going to look like and feel like to be in the chapel after you know, these uh, renovations have taken place. And so we wanted to show a little bit more uh, detail about the design of the louver system. And essentially the louver system does three functions. Uh, one is to direct light to the perimeter walls, um, specifically at each uh, panel, the skylight directs light to the opposite wall. It reduces the amount of light in the middle of the space. Um, there's still some indirect bounce light coming off the louvers that softly illuminates the, uh, the middle of the space, but it's not this you know, intense pool of light that you saw um, in the original image. And also the system is designed to kind of reduce the amount of direct raking light on the ceiling surface, which you remember in the, images where we had the, uh, the baffle or the umbrella, it created this raking lighting effect, which really highlighted the popcorn texture of the ceiling uh, that was there prior to this renovation. So, um, and the last thing that this is intended to do is to really manage the brightness um, that you see in your field of vision as a visitor in the space. When you're standing or sitting uh, on one of the benches, you are seeing um, the softly illuminated underside of the louver blade instead of getting you know, a very direct and bright view of the skylight itself. And in fact, um, one interesting thing to mention is that the lower face of the louver blades are a different color from the top. The top is white to bounce light around and into the space. The lower portion of that is actually a gray color to bring the brightness of the skylight down and to you know, help keep that from competing with the paintings. And even though it's gray, you really can't tell that it's gray because um, you know, you're just seeing the, uh, the louver with as less brightness than it would be if it were purely white. So with that, with those goals in mind, essentially each blade is specifically designed and angled to optimally light the, uh, the, the facing wall. And so that's kind of a quick overview of how the uh, skylight design was developed. The um, artificial lighting, uh, which really is there to supplement uh, the light as, as the chapel moves into the evening hours. And then also 
when there's no di daylight is based on this uh, the work that we did for the Star Spangled Banner. Here you can see in the lower two images, uh, the projector, um, we had to control digitally the amount of light across a very large surface with a very tight tolerance. And we used a similar uh, approach, uh, a projector for each painting or each uh, triptych panels. Uh, and we mapped uh, the light for each of the walls and each of the panels very precisely to get the artificial lighting falling solely on the walls and the paintings. And it's interesting to note that with the projector, we were able to control the amount of light differently on the painting and on the wall. Uh, and as Alyssa had, had mentioned, um, this, the collar uh, and contains the projector. And, and Owen, you might want to talk a little bit more in detail about that. Sure. Um, so we saw this skylight opening sort of ring as an opportunity to discreetly introduce the artificial lighting systems within the chapel. Um, so to achieve this, we have the projectors mounted within this ring. They are mounted vertically pointing down. And then we have a set of mirrors below that, uh, each of which bounces the light off and onto the facing wall. So for each of the um, each of the walls, each of the eight walls in the chapel, we have one projector and one mirror that light the entirety of the wall and the paintings on that wall. And as Alyssa had uh, mentioned earlier, this uh, ring where we have essentially concealed the projectors behind a fascia also became an opportunity to incorporate a lot of other services discreetly, including other artificial lighting and other architectural services that Alyssa mentioned. So this really shows a sort of the before 1999 re uh, renovation and, and the chapel as it is today. You can see, um, although the you can see the skylight, it's back to the, its, its original proportions. You can see the mirrors and the light uh, on the walls and the paintings. And we were able to mitigate the light on the ceiling, as Owen mentioned, and a very subdued uh, ambient light in the center of the room. Yes, yeah, so you can also see some of the artificial lighting that we've introduced. Um, these are general down lights. Uh, within the skylight ring. We also have fixtures for specifically for uh, speakers and events and programs that are happening within the chapel. So really there is there's quite a lot kind of going on behind the scenes up in that in that skylight ring and you know there's a, a lot of coordination work between us and ARO to make all of that uh, come together neatly. And, and to be as Alyssa said invisible. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Those are um, wonderful presentations, um, which that very last part, George, um, kind of leads into, I guess, my first question as a moderator. Um, you know, the, the chapel is adjacent to the Manil Museum, um, which is designed by Renzo Piano. He's, and the Manil famously also uses a, a louvered ceiling. Um, piano um, is said that his inspiration for that ceiling comes from when he first visited the site being overwhelmed by <laughs> the, the sun here in Houston. Um, and you said that you and your company has worked on other exhibits also utilizing daylight. Could you um, explain or kind of expand on how the louver system here at the Rothko is either similar to or different from the solution at the Manil Museum or some of your other exhibits that you have done? What makes uh, the Rothko in particular unique? Um. I think the, I mean, for me, um, this type of louver system was something that I uh, learned about from one of my mentors uh, in lighting in my early on in my career, a man named Edison Price. And it was really about 
uh, conceptually subtracting light rather than directing light in a way. It was about keeping light that you don't want uh, in the space, uh, you know, away from uh, the solution. I mean, the, the, we really wanted light just on the paintings. We didn't want light on the ceiling. We wanted a very little amount of light in the center of the space. And the louver system was really, uh, I think, conceptually that in a very simple sense, that's what the louver system was about. I think it differs from other museums that use louvers that are maybe uh, active, they open and they close, they change the quantity of light. Uh, we, we felt that uh, an active system at the Rothko Chapel would be very difficult to maintain and, and, and very expensive to install. So we wanted to design a very sustainable passive type of system and control light within a very particular range of, of quantity. Um, the Menil is, is different. Uh, it's an architectural solution. And I think it's it's not so much about directing light; it's about really modulating light uh, in space for a particular type of experience. Um, so I think uh, there's there's similarities, but I think there's some differences as well. Uh, the type of collections that the Meal has Meniel has can take a, a much wider variety of light levels. And at the Rothko Chapel, it's it's a very it's a more specific uh, type of solution in terms of light levels. Wonderful. Um, and you mentioned um, both Neil and in, in Georgia, your response just now, um, sustainability. Um, and so you, you, Neil, in your presentation, you mentioned some, some efforts were done to improve resiliency. Um, when this project was in design, I'm sure Harvey um, was fresh on the foundation's mind. If not, Harvey happened while it was in design. I'm not quite sure the schedule. Um, what are some of the solutions that you all implemented in order to improve resiliency? And what are some of the things that might be hidden to the eye um, that the visitor might not know about otherwise? Yeah, sure. I can speak to that a, a little bit. I mean, the, the um, one of the main things um, in the original um, condition, the uh, the HVAC for um, for the building itself. Uh, no, sorry, the, there's a generator um, for the building that was actually uh, installed below grade in a um, in a pit just to the north uh, east of the chapel, uh, which was um, vulnerable to flooding. So the um, the uh, site itself did not flood during Harvey, but we um, I think saw videos during that time of the water, uh, you know, breaching the curb and going like fairly close, uh, getting fairly close to the building. And yet yeah, you're you're right, they um, that experience was really uh, foundational or um, uh, certainly very present in their minds um, as as we designed it. I think timing was actually. Um, uh, I think the chapel was lucky to avoid any major damage, but also uh, spurred um, uh, to, you know, to it underline the importance of the changes that, that we were making. So uh, the biggest thing was relocating that equipment, um, providing the generator um, across the street above, um, above grade. We relocated uh, an electrical um, uh, transformer that was on the south side of the, uh, of Sol Ross, uh, again, to the north, um, to the north in that energy house. And, the energy house is currently two stories. And so all of that um, primary equipment is uh, located above the ground floor. Uh, in addition, all of the, um, at the chapel itself, um, we uh, reinforced each of the doors um, or, or installed um, removable flood barriers, uh, basically channels at the jams of each of the doors at the uh, entry and at the um, uh, service doors at the west and the east. Uh, for removable panels um, that are engineered to resist, uh, I think, three feet of um, uh, hydrostatic pressure. And then at all of the um, uh, new buildings uh, in phase one and phase two, uh, we've uh, raised um, the base uh, finished floor elevation and as well as installed uh, a curb around the building. So as a um, basically a, a passive uh, flood protection measure um, throughout all the buildings. 
And so the speaking of phase two, um, I know that part of the, the current phase has a welcome center. Um, do you have a, a schedule for phase two um, and the future projects as, and, and also how does phase two help further the programming efforts of um, the Rothko? Yeah, I can't speak um, very directly towards that. The schedule we are kind of completing design of phase two, we, we, um, uh, we're essentially getting ready to um, have documents ready to permanent bid uh, for the for the remainder of the project, um, and sort of as I mentioned, the uh, the chapel renovation in phase one uh, was really uh, in the service of uh, uh, strengthening the experience uh, within the chapel uh, and within the grounds. And uh, phase two kind of continues that mission. And one of the big components of that will be the creation of the program center, the program. Um, space, which is a, a large space that's actually proportionally very similar to the size of uh, the Chapel Sanctuary, uh, where uh, all of the events where um, the kind of quality and experience of the sanctuary isn't intrinsic or necessary to that, those programs. So there's a lot of uh, community events and forums and, and um, you know, even celebrations uh, or things like that. And there's also, you know, an expanded programming um, ambition of, of the chapel. So those types of programs are able to be relocated um, to the adjacent space, which uh, allows, uh, and the, those types of programs were um, essentially infringing on the ability of the chapel to kind of exist as um, this open accessible um, place of sanctuary and contemplation for the public. And uh, that the, just the creation of those new spaces to, um, uh, to free up the chapel to kind of be uh, like its best self or to kind of, to serve, uh, uh, more time as a, as a public um, space was really crucial to, to uh, what we're doing. Great. Um, and, and kind of finally, in your presentation, you mentioned Alyssa, that uh, you, you noticed that the CMU walls weren't reinforced and kind of going back and having to reinforce them to bring the building up to current structural codes. Um, were there any other type of, I guess, I want to say surprises or discoveries <laughs> um, or any um, kinks in the Houston or I, I guess permitting issues that you found in Houston that are unique to Houston um, that you had to make kind of fast solutions for um, during the project? That's a good question. I think certainly the, uh, the lack of reinforcing was by far the biggest surprise that we ran across that was <laughs> that was pretty jarring um, and we did have to I think scramble in a pretty big way to to understand what the implications of that were in terms of other permitting um, issues or, or things that were specific to Houston I think a lot of it was just timing you know um, there was a, I think at the point where we were trying to get it permitted there were certainly backups and so that caused some delays but um, I'm trying to think of any other surprises we might have run across. Fortunately, we only had one really big one like that. Um, <laughs> there was, that would have been uncomfortable. But uh, I think there were, I, I think stormwater might also have been one of the other issues that, you know, I think for Houston is obviously a, a quite a large one. Um, trying to make sure that we were meeting whatever the current uh, stormwater requirements were and that they were sort of evolving because of Harvey. Um, so trying to stay on top of that, and make sure that we we knew exactly what was um, what was required for for stormwater management. Okay. Yeah, I'd say maybe just to add one one element. It's not really a kink, um, but as Owen alluded to, the collar in the um, in the chapel is just kind of is a place where a lot of things overlap, a lot of um, design work by multiple consultants, and then ultimately um, fabrication and coordination between different trades to install all that work together. Um, there's a lot of you know, electrical, AV, uh, um, mechanical uh, lighting, obviously, um, all within a fairly tight space. And in, in, uh, we were trying to be very conscious of the final appearance there. So I think 
working closely within all of the design consultants as well as uh, the fabricator to get that um, designed and coordinated and fabricated was um, a significant challenge, um, but ultimately I think due to the quality of the team um, kind of on all, on all ends working together, it, I, I think it went relatively smoothly and um, we're certainly you know, thrilled with the final um, outcome there. Great. Well, um, I'll begin to kind of go over um, some of the questions that we have from the attendees. And the, one of the first questions that we have from the attendees um, is, um, are, are the projectors able to have, or do, do the projectors have the ability to control the lighting color um, at the painting at a higher intensity at a higher intensity than the walls. I'm sorry. The, yeah, and I can take that one. Um, the projectors are uh, map. We map the light on the project uh, from the projector onto the walls, so we can actually control the amount of light on the paintings differently from the amount of light on the walls. So we have one projector per wall or per triptych or painting. And the light, uh, the light level is calibrated to put more light on the painting and less light on the wall. So, yeah, I mean, the answer to that simply is yes. We, we do control the two surfaces um, differently. And just to add to that slightly, it's, it's a very subtly elevated um, increase in the light level on, on the paintings. You know, it's, if, if you if you weren't aware of it, you almost wouldn't know that you know the paintings are spotlit. It just just allows you to see more of the texture and work in the paintings. And there was a I guess a question related to that in terms of color temperature. Uh, the the chapel was meant to be a daylight a daylit space, so there's really nothing in the louvers or the glass that we do uh, to alter the sort of color temperature of daylight. And I mean, what, what we probably don't, what people don't understand is that daylight color temperature is changing all the time. It's rapidly changing and it changes with a cloud or blue sky or, uh, you know, so it's, it's a very dynamic light. And I think it's one of the things that uh, we really love about daylight is it's change in intensity, it's changing color uh, throughout the course of the day. Um, and then the projectors are, are a constant color temperature. I think I just want to mention just that the that change that you're talking about, George, um, and the understanding of the change in light temperature, like light lighting conditions. If you're inside the chapel and you feel a cloud going past the sun, like there's a um, a specific desire to uh, have that experience within the chapel be. Um, be known or be be understood, um, and the kind of design solution really responds directly to that. Um, we have another question um, along those lines, and that's um, how much uh, foot candle difference, or is there a foot candle difference between the top and the bottom of the paintings? Um, Owen, you want to speak to that? Uh, yeah, there is there is a slight difference um, in the foot candle level from the daylight between the top and the bottom. Um, it's it's not severe. Um, I, th I think it's probably a ratio of ten to eight or something like that from top to bottom. Um, the artificial lighting is quite uniform top to bottom. Um, I, I don't I don't remember the specific numbers, but it's very close to consistent. Um, another question we have is, how do each of you think uh, Rothko will respond to the new environment for his work? Question. Good, good <laughs> question. Deep, deep breath, George. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I can't channel Rothko and, and I think that, uh, I mean, Christopher, and his sister, the, you know, really the two survivors um, in the family. And I think th this is probably a better question for them. 
to understand, you know, how they, how, how their father would have felt about this. Um, I, I don't know how to answer that question. Yeah, I would just say that having Christopher being an instrumental part of um, the project that he chaired the, um, uh, the board, uh, the building, uh, the site committee um, and his sensitivity to I think all, all issues um, dealing with the chapel and the work was really, I think, uh, set the tone for um, kind of our, our responses and uh, was really invaluable. And he's also written a wonderful book about his father and, and his father's work in the chapel. So, uh, you know, I think that that that's a good reference for that uh, to begin to understand uh, how to answer that question. And um, the last question that we have from the audience um, is asking about I guess the, the pros and cons between um, natural light versus the artificial light um, when it comes to viewing the paintings. Um, is one better than the other? Um, and what do you think would be, I guess, the, the pros and yeah, the pros and cons between the two? Um, to this earlier. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, as I said, natural lighting is very dynamic and it's something that uh, is sort of uh, built into, I guess, our DNA as humans. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think that um, I, I wouldn't say that natural light is better than artificial light. It's just a, it's a totally different experience. And so I think our, as Neil said, you know, we wanted to really retain the connection uh, between the outside and the inside and for people to sort of understand the paintings under natural light. Um, the artificial lighting, uh, we, you know, we wanted it to be carefully controlled and it, it is by nature static. Uh, it's not a light show. Um, so there are two, two different experiences. Um, and I think both of them have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Natural light was certainly uh, in the beginning for the chapel, a big problem because it, you know, if, if natural light isn't controlled properly, it can damage works of art. And I think there was certainly that worry uh, in the beginning. And it's certainly one of the things we were concerned about. Um, we worked with um, a conservator uh, who's, who'd been with the Meal, Meal collection for many, many years and, and sort of understanding the the lighting requirements and parameters that we needed to design to. And just to add one note to that, we also understood from discussions with Christopher Rothko and historic records that Mark Rothko really wanted his paintings to be seen in natural light as much as possible. And so with, with that in mind, it's largely designed to be a, a naturally lit space whenever it can be. And the artificial lighting is really there for those instances where you need, you know, when it's in the evening or, you know, a very dark cloudy day where it, there's just not enough natural light on its own. Um, and we have a couple of other questions that have come in. Um, one kind of piggybacks on that topic. Um, do you, do you have an idea of what the average level of um, daylight for candle contribution is versus artificial contribution? Understanding that the daylight is dynamic, but is there, um, I guess, a goal to be reached with regards to those numbers? That was certainly part of our calculations. Um, oh, and I think we were designing to uh, sort of a, an average exp annual exposure. Um, and so we looked at both how much, you know, how much daylight was uh, entering the space over the course of the year and then how much artificial lighting we would be adding over the course of the year. So that you, you get obviously more light in the summer or on a bright day and less light in the winter or a dark and cloudy day. So there's enough data that exists uh, to really do some fairly precise calculations. And 
you know, we, we used our computer models and, and obviously the physical model to, to determine uh, those, those goals and parameters. Yes, and um, specifically, it's designed to an average of 15 foot candles of combined artificial and natural lighting average over the course of the year. Um, so were there any other design feature in addition to the darker color of the pavement or flooring treatment at the chapel? Well, I think, um, I mean, the landscape <clears throat> and the increase in landscape and shade trees is, you know, a sort of important design feature. And it will certainly be more as the landscape matures. Um, that was a very important discussion early on in the project. And certainly uh, the, the landscape MBW really, you know, took that conversation to heart and, and that was part of their design. Um, the finish of the plaza was, was darker. Um, the colors in the, in the foyer were darker. So these were all things, all elements that were sort of part of crafting uh, the, the, the visitor experience. Oh man, I guess for one final question to kind of get a summary from everyone. Um, what were some of the, what do you think you, what do you feel like you enjoyed most about this project or what was, is there any personal connection that you all as a team member received from working on such a project? Here's what I found. <laughs> Well, uh, with every project, I think it's the, uh, the collaboration of a team that uh, is always new and refreshing and exciting. Um, this was our first project with ARO um, and our first project uh, with the Rothko uh, Chapel staff and board. Um, so to me, that was special and very rewarding. Uh, there were lots of design challenges that I certainly, that Owen and I certainly faced, uh, you know, with this project and, you know, that those were exciting challenges and things that we enjoyed uh, grappling with and working with the team on. Yeah, I would second that and also mention that I think there was a clarity of purpose or sort of an alignment of goals throughout the team and the client as well that um, sort of allowed us you know, the freedom to explore those uh, different solutions to those design challenges, but also ultimately have a very clear way of kind of assessing um, the success of those or kind of having very uh, frank discussions about, you know, um, what things are in support of the experience, what is important about the experience, what is important about the history um, uh, of, you know, the space or, or uh, certain things. So I felt like, like those types of, um, discussions were really fruitful, but also the fact that we were all kind of aligned in terms of uh, purpose and the mission was very clear. Um, I, I felt like made for a very, um, a really rewarding, I think, experience through, like, throughout the design and construction process. Picking up on that, I think I think Neil's exactly right that there's this sort of a, I felt like there was a real synergy um, between the design team, the CM, the, uh, the chapel, and client group. Um, and there was a sort of an understanding of, of you're doing a lot of work that really ultimately becomes, um, it's sort of, it's, it's so, it's really about just sort of really small adjustments making all the difference uh, in this project. It's not necessarily a big design move. It's about this sort of very careful fine tuning um, of the space and light. And I thought that that was uh, just a really interesting way to work and, um, uh, it did take a lot of alignment, I think, between the different groups working on, on the project to get that to happen. I, I don't think I could say it any better than George, Neil, and Alyssa have, but, um, you know, I, I like to think that we've all you know, helped or uh, 
we've been facilitators of hopefully a you know positive experience for the visitors the chapel as well and that hopefully the things that we've done have made it um made it a more positive experience for them and you know made the chapel accessible in ways that might not have been before wonderful um so i'm carrie is going to come back and join us as we close but sure. yeah and, uh, thank you oh and i think that was a a perfect uh segue to end on um the experience that visitors get when they enter the chapel you know it's a place of contemplation and a place of action as neil mentioned so I would encourage anyone who's listening who hasn't been to the chapel yet uh, to get there as soon as you can. Um, to all of our panelists, uh, George and Owen, Neil and Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This has been such an enlightening, no, no pun intended, discussion and, and really great to hear the backstory of how this special place can now be enjoyed even more uh, Greg, thank you so much for your work to moderate this. Um, Jennifer, thanks for putting this together. And um, to everyone listening, uh, this is going to be recorded if you'd like, or it has been recorded if you'd like to view it again later. And as Greg mentioned, the Architecture Center Houston is open. We'd love to have you come uh, visit our new space. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it.